Well, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me. Uh, what I'm going to do today is talk about my experience of Sense Networks and some ideas for the future. So um, I started this 20 years ago, almost, uh, 2002. Um, and this is the, the front cover of Computer Magazine in 2004, where they had a special issue on, environment, uh, on Sense Networks. And we wrote the, the chapter on um, environmental sensor networks. And you can see that we were lucky to be highlighted on the front cover. This is our um, probe, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And we talked about how there are three sciences that kind of you need to understand for sensor networks. Firstly, sensors, communications, and computers, computing. And we talked about the challenges. So this is back in 2004 that you needed um, to allow sensor networks to happen. And in particular with sensor networks, the two sort of problems we highlighted were power management and radio communications, because most sensor network systems were kind of indoors where there's plenty of power and there's not much problem with communications. But when you go outside, that's when all the sort of problems, problems occur. And then a couple of years later in 2006, we wrote a paper can see there um, a, a review paper called um, a revolution in uh, system science because what we suggested was that sensor networks are about to take off and they're going to be a really really big thing um, and we made some predictions about the future now what are sensor networks well they are essentially oh, you embed sensors in the environment they send their data by usually by wireless onto the internet so in theory you have live or almost live data from the field and that's the excitement about them that suddenly you can sense the environment from your desk you can use it for hazard warning so you can you know, make predictions about events you can use it for fundamental science so that's particularly important in, in say places like glaciology where you, it's very difficult to get to the environment in the winter so you need something which continually monitors and volcanoes are another another example which hazardous and you can bring this together to have some concept of smart monitoring where you might sense more if the weather says there's going to be a potential an avalanche then you could sense more um, and so have some idea of kind of, of smart smart monitoring and we can see sensor networks as part of a continuum um, within the environmental sciences so back in the 70s really we started developing logging where you, you have sensors they they have their data um, stored probably initially on magnetic tape but then um, uh, on uh, SD cards and you go back and you collect the data perhaps once a year but you've no idea whether it's actually working throughout that year so you've got to wait usually a whole year with the fingers crossed so the excitement of the sensor network is that you're constantly getting the data back so that you have a system where you have sensor nodes in your environment they send the data to a base station which then forwards that data essentially onto the internet so that you can check and get your data back and that's the excitement and then we move on to the next phase the phase that i'm going to talk about that we're in now which is the internet of things and this is where we have both both ways so we're not only having data coming back from the field but we're also able to talk to the nodes in the field and that we we use internet pro protocols to talk to these so basically the nodes are like web pages and they're connected directly. Um, I'm just going to start with a couple of slides about pre um, the, 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 the um, 20th century. Um, in the olden days, I didn't have big data, I had small data. Each individual, I didn't have many data points, but they took a lot of effort to get. And also because you were camping, you were really low tech. You really had very little chance of any um, power to your to your systems so as you as you kind of move towards the 20th century 21st century so as you move towards the 21st century um, you started to need power in research and um, and this is particularly illustrated by um, by the um, what's called GPR ground penetrating radar which is a fantastic tool in glaciology because it tells you how deep the glacier is where the rivers are relatively easy to use but very very power hungry so all of a sudden you need power um, in the field. 
And I want to contrast this with our early days in sense networks. And you see it's a completely different environment um, to work in. There's always at last minute things that have to be done. You need power. You need somewhere that's dry um, for, all that, um, for all those instruments. Now, why did I get into it? I'm, my basic research is in subglacial processes. Now, the subglacial environment, so the environment under the glacier, it's one of the least explored environments on Earth because it's so difficult to get down there and find out what's happening. And yet it's vital because it controls um, the rate at which glaciers respond to climate change, and it's vital in understanding the rate at which sea level rise is going to occur. And there's two ways you can do it. You can either wait for the glacier to melt away and look at the sedimentology, or you can do what's called in situ process studies. So you basically do experiments beneath the glacier. And during the 1990s, there were a series of experiments, really exciting experiments um, that were done with wired instruments and the data was stored um, on memory cards. And so we went into this to try and sort of update this, to try and put all the, the instruments into one probe, into a multi-sensor probe and to send the data back um, via, via radio and it, have it as a part of a sensor network. So we installed these probes, they're about 16 centimeters long, either in the sediment beneath the glacier, the till, or in the ice itself. They send the data back to the surface, um, the data is then relayed to a reference station which has mains electricity, and then goes onto a server and onto the web. So this was the, the GlaxWeb system. We started this initially in Brickdale's Green in Norway, um, we then moved to, to Iceland, we then moved to the Cairngorms, which I'll talk about, a short trip to Iceland, I'm sorry, to Greenland, and then back, back to Iceland again. So this, this is Brick Dahl's Green, where we initially uh, started to work. This is it in 2001, um, 2002, and you can see that the minute we started to work there, it rapidly uh, retreated until by 2006, we couldn't work there anymore. Um, and although this, this is one glacier, this is pretty, although an extreme example, this is pretty typical of all glaciers in the world. Almost all glaciers are retreating, not all of them as fast as this, but certainly glaciers are retreating. So after that, we moved um, to work at Skalafjallsjökull in Iceland, a little bit more of a stable glacier, um, but it was a great place to work similarly. So the systems changed over the years as um, technology improved, but this is the basic system, again, we used, used in Iceland. We've got the probes in the glacier, sending their data um, onto the base station, onto some sort of gateway. In this case, we were able at the end to have a 16 kilometer Wi-Fi link to a farm and then going into the cloud. And so we were able to get data back every day um, for, for um, two years was the maximum we got, but um, over a, a kind of a, a 10 year period on and off. So this, this is the details about the probes. These are the uh, frequencies we're using. Um, we managed to reduce the frequencies as the years went by. And we're essentially measuring temperature, pressure, strain, conductivity, and tilt. Um, this is um, the probe diagram, for those interested. So on the surface of the glacier, we have a base station. And this in itself is quite difficult because of course the glacier is always moving. And in the winter, there's a lot of snow. So everything has to be um, really watertight. And on the um, base station, we have, um, we have the, the links to the rest of the world. We have a GPS weather station and the power. Um, in this case, we've got a, a solar power and uh, also wind power. Uh, this is uh, inside of the base station box. Again, everything has to be absolutely um, watertight because um, any water in will you know, completely wreck it. We use uh, a number of different systems, but this is one in particular where we had a, um, a Linux-based base station. And then you need somewhere which does have um, mains electricity. And in this case, there was a, a cafe um, a kilometer away and which had, um, again, a weather station, GPS, Wi-Fi. And at the final stage, our, our site is about there. And we were able to send by Wi-Fi our data down to this um, friendly farm um, where it was then um, put onto the internet. But it did have to cope with severe weather. I suppose I should say that one of the, you know, our kind of 
rationale from the beginning was that if we can get the sensor network to work in a glacial environment, then hopefully it will work anywhere. Um, just a thing to show you about the kind of communications adaptation. There are a few pictures of working in, in a glacial environment. I mean, it's pretty hard to put the, to get the um, sensor network to, to work and you need a lot of people. Um, here's us with the, the GPR. Um, in order to get the probes into the glacier at all, you need to have to drill a hole using hot water and use the, a hot water drill. And this weighs 200, kilo, sorry, 200 kilograms. Um, in Norway, we, we were able to fly onto the glacier with a helicopter, um, but they don't have many helicopters in, in Iceland. So instead it was driven on um, with a vehicle. So um, quite a lot of work to actually get the system to work at all. And I've got some slides here. Um, this is um, us drilling the, drilling the hole. <laughs> And it takes about two hours to drill the hole down to the bed of the glacier. We put our probes in about a maximum of 70 meters, and that was about as deep as we could get the signal back. And this is um, a video showing what the, the holes look like. So we have made this with our, our own um, custom made webcam going down, bore cam. And you can see at the first, the light is lit actually by daylight, but as you get darker and darker, um, you get deeper and deeper, it gets darker and you can't. And eventually you reach a water level because you've melted the glacier and the water will stay in the hole. Um, first time we went through, um, it went completely black. So we had to have a bit of a rethink and uh, waterproof the, the camera a bit better. Um, and this is it when it's very, I've, I've edited this. This is close to the bottom of the borehole. And you can see that um, hazy nature. That's the sediment from the base coming into the water. And in this particular case, we made a mistake and drilled where there was a river. And you'll see that the, the image is moving. Um, and that, that's because we've accidentally uh, hit a river. Um, and you go through and you can see the base. And it's actually very rare to see the base of the glacier because it's, it's so difficult to get down there. We've got to move it a little bit for the focus, but there's, there's some till at the base there. And this is an image of us putting, putting the probe in and there it goes um, down, down the hole. And what we do is that we basically we've blasted away the till. Um, we put the probe in and the probe, the, the till will then close back around the probe um, so that it becomes embedded. And this is a little graphic that we've got that we made from the tilt measurements. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, showing the movement of the probe. So when it first goes in, it moves around a lot because there's this open hole because you've, you know, you've blasted away the till, but eventually the till will close around the probe and hold it in its natural position. And here it is now. And from now on, it moves. Um, it moved a, a predictable amount, but it, it is kind of set in, set into its position. So I don't want to go into the, the details about what we found, but basically we're able to, to produce this first environmental sensor network in a glacial environment with our own custom hardware and software. But for the first time, we we're actually able to show how probes move, how plasts move within the till. And this is a big, big question in, um, in glacial sedimentology. And also able to get these um, seasonal measurements of stick motion and make some estimates about subglacial sedimentary processes, which again, very difficult to do, and we're very proud that, that we were able to do this. So now I want to talk a little bit about Internet of Things. So here's this concept of Internet of Things. You see that quote there, a world where physical objects are seamlessly integrated into the formation, into the information network. So and here's some examples on this slide of, of some sort of off-the-shelf things you can buy for Internet of Things. As you can see, they're mostly uh, indoor type, type activities. Um, as I said before, it's much easier indoors. But we wanted to apply this concept to the outside world. And we decided to try and do it in the Cairngorms in Scotland. So um, this is where our, our field site is on, on the Cairngorm Plateau. And we were using uh, this Internet of Things concept to look at um, some periglacial features on the surface and look at some, some peat studies. 
this is a kind of image of a typical sort of um, periglacial landscape up there. Now, we, we did actually choose this site because one of the problems with working in Iceland is it's, it's pretty tough to work there. And also, it's very difficult to get there outside of the summer. And sometimes um, things break down and it's nice to be able to visit them throughout the winter, which is very hard to do. So we thought that in Scotland, it would be much easier to, to access the, the mountains. And we chose a site where there's a road, um, an estate road, that goes up to the surface private road and we were allowed to use it by the, the landowner. But before you could get to the road, there was a ford. And uh, unfortunately, every time it rains, it meant that the river rose. And of course, in Scotland, it typically rains quite a lot. So unfortunately, we were actually prevented from, from visiting our site as often as we'd like to because of this um, access problem. But once you could cross the ford, you could drive to the surface. And it's, a, it's right up on the plateau. So this is a view of the system. This is a plan view. Um, so essentially we have a series of nodes again in the landscape, but this time each node has this global IP address. So basically it has its own um, website, uh, web uh, site. And these um, talk to each other to a local base station, which we call on, on this diagram, a router node. And these router nodes were approximately a kilometer apart. They talk to each other and then um, they were able to talk by six low pan down to the estate building. And that was three, a three kilometer um, reach. And in the estate building, there's electricity. And so we were able to forward the data onto the internet via a satellite link. And this was set up so that we could add extra nodes into the system. And here's a picture um, showing our um, us in action. So these are, these are these router nodes that I was telling you about. Um, and here's some us inserting some uh, instruments into these periglacial features. And here's people, how they get up onto the plateau. So instead of making everything ourselves, we've, we now have moved to these standard protocols. So each of these different elements are different parts um, of the system. But each of these now we're using standard, um, a, a, a standard way, uh, and together they are um, linking. We also did some experiments with web interfaces. Um, we found that HTTP was unsuitable, so we used this CoAP thing, which is basically the Internet of Things equivalent, and we used this operating system from Tiki. So this is what one of our, our nodes looks like. You can see all the rel relative elements of it. And this is a, an overview of the, uh, the sensor nodes. And we had sort of two, two sets of sensors. We had some very sort of typical off the shelf things. And then we developed some smart sensors where we were trying to look at how um, water pressure and temperature and, and tilt changed in the soil profile. So here's us um, deploying one. So this is one of our router nodes and this is the, the power source. This is an example where we're looking at changes in water level um, and one of these little lockens. And we were able to to um, get a quite nice data set. This is an example of how the different um, temperature throughout the profile going down from the surface. So the great thing about this system is that it is that it did work. So what we learned, well, we learned that you can see there um, sub gigahertz low power radios are sufficient to, to provide the range. And that this six low pan provides um, internet protocols everywhere. And we were able to use this, this co-app to provide standard interfaces. So essentially we managed to get that Internet of Things system working up on the Cairngorm Plateau. And now I want to move on to, to another system and this is um, our web connected RTK DGPS system in Iceland. Now before I, I talk about that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we, we got involved in this. Now, interestingly, we were contacted by um, Formula E 
And they asked us whether we thought it would be, um, whether you could put a, um, a, one of these cars um, onto an iceberg and track it. The idea being that because it was Formula E, that it was you know, supposedly green, um, we said we didn't think it was a very good idea, but um, they asked us if we could make an iceberg tracker. So in a ridiculously short amount of time, um, we made this tracker and um, they put it on this iceberg um, in this location here in Greenland. And using Iridium satellite, we were able to track the iceberg um, on its journey as it headed off towards Newfoundland. And it traveled about 500 kilometers in two months before we lost it. Presumably it, it um, fell off the iceberg. But it was a good, it was a good sort of um, introduction to this whole um, tracker idea, which we've been um, toying with anyway. So um, in many aspects of um, environmental science, we use GPSs. And traditional GPSs, of course, are very expensive. Um, so you can never afford to have very many. And most of them still store their data on memory cards because they are, um, it takes a lot of energy. They have very long messages. So it takes a lot of energy to get the data back. So what we wanted to do was to make a much smaller one that uh, was cheap, so it didn't matter, you could let it fall into a crevasse or, or, or fall off the front of the glacier, um, and which would send short messages so that we could get so we could get that data back live. So luckily there's a kind of new generation of um, GPS boards which allow you L1, L2, RTK GPS. So that's very high precision GPS. There's a number of different companies, but the one we went for was um, Swift Navigation. Oops, sorry. And so we we um, built the system, which has this GPS system running on MicroPython, and we used um, Iridium short messaging to, to get the data back. So that's a, a, essentially a sat phone to get the data back. And so we, this enables us to, we were able to have like short messages that um, could come back every single day. And we were taking um, three measurements, sorry, four measurements, um, a day, which gives us a really good detail about glacier movement. And because obviously, because it's a cheap system, you can have more of them. So this is um, a picture of the, the inside of, of the unit. Again, everything's got to be incredibly waterproofed. Um, and we've set it up in, in two adjacent glaciers in Iceland, uh, Bailamerkjökull and Fjallsjökull. And the idea is that we, we look adjacent glaciers should be behaving the same because they're next to one another but um, we're sort of looking at how they behave differently they're both retreating um, uh, as, as many glaciers and in Iceland there's this um, additional thing that since 1990 the lakes in front of the Icelandic glaciers have been growing much quick very quickly and that's caused the glaciers to increase their, their melt rate And one way of, of understanding subglacial processes is to measure the glacier velocity. And you can either do that from, from satellite remote sensing um, through UAV, uh, repeat UAV surveys, um, which we've been doing, and also by using the GPS. And the thing about um, the GPS is that you have a low spatial cover, but you have very high temporal resolution, whilst um, it's kind of opposite with the remote sensing, although the best coverage um, maybe is probably at the moment it's about um, once every 12 days, you can have big coverage but low temporal resolution. So if you can have all three of these, then you've really got a good um, understanding of, of glacier response to uh, individual weather events. So this is the, um, the rover sitting on, on the glacier. This is a kind of adapted Icelandic version which the Icelandic metalfish use and we've kind of adapted that. You can see it's got its uh, um, its solar panel on and, and the, the antenna etc and this is the base station that sits on on a moraine in front of the glacier and the data that we've got back um, is very impressive the, the, which they show lots of exciting things about these two glasses which are completely adjacent but are behaving very differently and the great thing is that we've got data from we installed this in 2017 and um, it worked, we, we had to go back and change the batteries and update a few things, but it worked until last summer. 
And of course, last summer we were unable to go back because of, of the COVID and we we're unable to go back this summer. So unfortunately they're, they're still sitting out there at the moment, but the batteries have unfortunately run out. But we're able to get three years worth of data for this and we're very pleased. And we have been, um, we're involved in a um, initial experiment from, from Swarm, which is a, a, micro, a nano satellite company. And they've given us the kit to try and change from Iridium messaging to this, um, these nanosats. And that's something we're gonna try, um, hopefully when we go back next summer. So what have we found from, from this work? Well, we found that we, we developed this first sense network for glaciers using um, custom hardware and software. We then developed this IoT style sense network, which uses standards based protocols. And then we've developed this web connected RTK DGPS system. And although we've developed it for a glacier, you could use this in, in many other environmental systems. And it, it worked for, for three years, and we're very pleased about that. Right, well, we're back to the, the kind of the beginning. When will the revolution happen? So when we wrote that paper back almost 20 years ago, we imagined that there would be a huge take up of sensor networks. And although there, 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 are, there is, has been some take up, it hasn't been um, as much as we initially thought. Now we recently um, just published this paper um, about sensor networks and geohazards in a, an e-book called Treaties and Geomorphology, um, where we looked at particular sensor networks and geohazards and did a review of those. And there are quite a lot of sensor networks. Um, the kind of traditional ones. Um, interesting use of UAVs for hazard um, detection. And also this growing field of, of citizen science where sensors are perhaps being carried by people and, and sort of a, a different way of perhaps looking at sensor networks. So there has been activity, but maybe not as that much activity as we'd initially thought. So challenges, if we come back to those challenges that we talked about at the beginning, uh, miniaturization, batteries are still a problem. Obviously, there's all sorts of problems about um, lithium batteries in the environment as well. Um, you, you, we said, I, I didn't mention this, but we said at the beginning that you really want your system that doesn't destroy the environment. You want a system that fits into the environment that like, essentially mimics it. You want to make sure you are actually monitoring the environment, but you don't want to damage it in any way. Um, power management has improved. Still a long way to go though. Um, radio communication, there's more choice. I've got a slide to talk about that in a minute. Scalability, still problems. Um, remote management is a lot more improved um, with an IoT system. Usability, still poor, I'll come back to that. Um, standardization, again, improvements, but needs uptake. Security, um, more awareness, strong culture protocols. And there's always problems of having um, kit out on the environment and um, the security in both sort of both meanings of the word really. And something we hadn't thought about, of course, was big data. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that prior to, to working on sensor networks, I basically worked on small data, but times have changed and big data is, you know, everywhere. And it's so important that environmental scientists have a training in how to deal with big data. Now, although we have, you know, the fair, um, protocols, there's still a, a long way to go about where this data is being kept and who can have access to it and all those sort of different issues, which you know, it, it, it's, it's still a problem. So this is a little um, diagram showing communication systems that are available at the moment. Obviously they keep changing all the time, but this graph shows sort of power against range. And when you're designing an a, a environmental sensor network, you kind of need to know um, what range and power you have available and each one will be subtly different and have its own sort of positives and negatives. And I think there's, there's kind of two ways to standardize sensor networks at the moment. You either have a system like this where sort of only this part of it is in the internet. So, so you kind of have one radio type protocol or you go for this IoT stack where the whole thing um, has web and internet standards, so you can have a mix of, of software and hardware. And we think this is this is the way to go, and this is the system we used in Scotland. But there are places where you can you can only use this system. 
So um, conclusion, oh, I finished a bit early, haven't I? But conclusion, um, for this you need, you absolutely need a dedicated and multidisciplinary team. Um, you need the environmental scientists to understand exactly what you're measuring because you've really got to try and mimic the environment. There's no point measuring something that isn't useful. Um, you've really got to try and measure it exactly. And you've got to understand that, that, that environment. And then you also need the engineers and computer scientists because at the moment um, it, it's still at a kind of laboratory level. You really need that high expertise. Funding, you need funding. It's incredibly expensive to do any of this. Um, although we, we've talked about low cost, it, everything's, everything's relative. And you definitely need patience and good humour. It's very hard working in these environments, even if you're working in Scotland, which is not obviously as, as uh, cold or uh, remote as uh, as a glacial environment. You still you still need kind of good humour to get on because things go wrong. Things always go wrong, um, and it's always raining. So the future, um, as I said, I think we you know we've 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 come a long way in 20 years. There are sense networks, there are a lot more than there were, but we haven't perhaps had the take up that we expected. But I think I still have faith that I think the revolution will take place. I think that we're at stage now where it's gonna take off because environmental sensing is the future. The fact that you can sit in your, your office and monitor the environment is, is just such a benefit to, to all environmental scientists, to society in general. It's such a good thing. Um, that I think it is going to take off um, rapidly now. Um, and I think that's because there is more standardization. We can make more web-like sensor networks and, and people are used to using the web. And so this is not such a big uh, step, of, step up for them. And there are far more sensor networks than there were. And I think that our big, our big problem what's holding us back at the moment really is usability. I think we've kind of made good progress with the standards, but it's just the usability that's perhaps holding people back at the moment. Well, I couldn't, I couldn't possibly have done this on my own. And it's a really big team has um, been involved in the projects over the years. And here's a photo of all the, all the members in the team. You need a lot of people, as I said, you need lots of different types of expertise, both um, environmental scientists and computer scientists. But uh, you know, there's, there's so much that you can achieve. All right, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jane. That was a really great talk. Um, delighted to see that you're using the, um, the the Swift Pixie board. I backed that on Kickstarter when it first came out. So uh, delighted that it's, uh, it's out in the wild. Uh, there's some great questions coming in. Um, so I'll direct these to you in turn. Um, so there's two questions actually, and you started to allude to this in some of the slides towards the end. Um, what are your thoughts on the deployment of non-recoverable sensors into the natural environment that then become litter at end of life? And uh, do any of your probes get collected or do they have to be left in the environment? This is something that um, we have to grapple with a lot in environmental science. So if you could give us some comments on that. Yeah, um, it would be lovely if we could have biodegradable sensors and that would be, um, Kind of the aim for the future. Um, at the moment, we don't. Um, we've oh, we can't recover our probes. Um, we'd love to, but we couldn't. In fact, because as you saw at the beginning, our um, our glacier uh, brick does bring completely retreated on us. Um, at one point, our kit fell into the lake because um, it melted so quickly, and uh, we were able to go out with BBC News actually um, to try and try and collect it because we thought we could rescue it. And we did find a little bit, we managed to get the base station. And then we went out with a, um, a metal detector um, to see if we could find it around the edge of the lake, um, but we couldn't. Um, yeah, it's sad. And I think this is something that we need to move into in the future to try and build environmental sensing systems that are you know, less damaging to the environment, but we're not there yet. What was the second part of the question? Uh I think I think you've covered that. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, so yeah, some, something quite difficult that we have to deal with soon. Um, next question: Are sensors for one environment, for example, glaciers, really that different from another, for example, atmospheric sensors? Well, again, this is um, 
Uh, um, no, I, I think that it's, it depends, oh, I, I'm sorry, I forgot what I was saying. I was going to say before that at the beginning, to, uh, in 2002, the big thing was to have this concept of smart dust. Um, the idea that you could have sensors that were so small that they could sense the environment. But we've kind of been against that from the beginning because we thought that that would be so dangerous in the environment that it would be like releasing uh, microplastics into the environment. So we've been, I don't think that the future is uh, smart dust at all. Um, are sensors interchangeable? That would be a nice thing um, to have. But I think that for most settings, because of the power management problems, you really need to build it specifically for that environment. Um, you could build a system which, which, which had, if I go back to this slide um, with the communication system, you maybe could have built a system where, which had different um, communication elements and would click in. You could perhaps you know, change it to, to, to be able to operate on different levels. And similarly, you could, with an Internet of Things system, you could make it change and what sensors it sensed but i think it would very much depend on what you were actually sensing because in most situations you've got to make it as low power and um, efficient as possible and it might not be efficient to have multi-use sensors so it really depends in what environment you were using if you have plenty of power and plenty of connectivity then you could do that great thank you um a question from matt lewis um High latitude places experience little sunlight during the winter. Has this been a problem for your research, for example, data bias in monitoring or powering of sensors? Uh, what's your what's your power management strategy for the winter? Well, I suppose a basic power management is to make everything as low power as possible. Um, we also had a, a very clever system where the probes actually stored their data on um, RAM so that if they couldn't talk that day, they would store it um, until they could uh, talk. And that worked quite well because there were some times where the weather was so bad that the, the communication system didn't work down to the bed of the glacier. And they, they worked pretty well. And in fact, they, they stored data for almost, I think, four months. Um, so that, that worked well. Yes, there are obviously problems with. Um, with power on the surface. And that's why we had the wind power, which is pretty good because it's pretty windy in, in Iceland. And the solar power is not that much use in, in the winter, but it's okay in the summer. So we actually managed quite well because our key strategy was as low power as possible. So obviously some days it was just impossible, but in general, okay. Um, next question. Uh... How is data from sensors embedded for long time scales calibrated to ensure accuracy? Do you have to do any sensor calibration? Uh, yes, we, we, we calibrated all the sensors before they were, were put in in the lab. Yeah. But and another you know what the drift is. Sorry. Sorry. I was going to ask do you, do you have an idea of the kind of drift on your sensors for long deployments? We, yes. Um, Yes, we do have an idea because there are other ways that we could tell, say, like, for instance, how thick the glacier was. We, we, yes, we had a few parameters, independent parameters, that you could get some idea of the drift. Um, I was going to say something, I've forgotten. Uh, oh, yes, we also had a system where we put some probes into the till beneath the glacier because we're interested in sub processes, but we also put some into the, the ice, so we didn't drill beneath the ice. So we knew for certain they were in the ice because we hadn't reached the till. And so then we could tell, because we knew some were definitely in the ice and some that we thought were, were in the, the till, and we could see difference in the sensor reading. So you could really sort of see um, that, that there was that sort of binary difference. And sometimes we actually found the pro one probe actually popped out of the glacier, even though it was 60 meters deep, it popped out because obviously it came out of the till into the ice till interface and zoomed up, um, shot up a crevasse um, and came onto the surface. And so you could actually, in the readings, see a sort of intermediate when, when a probe is actually at the ice till interface, which is quite interesting, something we didn't sort of expect. That must have been a surprise. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, question from Matt Fry. Uh, 
what do you think what do you see as key components to increase uptake of sensor network technologies are there opportunities to provide standard packages of kit and data platforms to make it easy for researchers to do this without a, t a whole team or does every problem need a different solution and i guess this is particularly applicable to environmental scientists those of us who haven't got uh, much background in engineering how do we increase the uptake of these technologies yeah i mean that that is that is the, the key question i mean at the moment you do need a team, but the plan is, you know, that is what we want in the future. We want everybody to be able to use it, just like you use a mobile phone, just like you can take a GPS off the shelf. We want it to be able to, everyone to be able to use it. And as I tried to say in the talk, you know, we're moving towards it. These IoT standards are helping people move towards it, but we we just need to somehow kind of jump over that, that threshold into usability. Um, and perhaps this is where this particular, you know, digital environment can help with that, that, that jump, that, that vital step that we need. Great. Um, next question from Thomas turpin Jolfs. Hello, Thomas. Um, do you think the launch of space-based cellular broadband networks that can provide global 4G, 5G connectivity will make the setup of sensor networks more affordable and increase uptake? Yes, I mean, I think this is all, this is all, all, all part of it. Yes, I think that it, it will be helpful. I mean, it, it was, this is sort of just an anecdote, but when we were in um, Norway, you could stand on the glacier and your mobile phone works. I mean, we live in the New Forest and our mobile phone doesn't work here. So, um, you know, connectivity is absolutely vital um, for Internet of Things. So, yeah, it's going to be really helpful. That's why we're so excited as well to try out these nanosats and see see how that's how that's going to work. Yeah, that's going to be very 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 interesting. We're we're trying out a, a couple of uh, couple of similar versions, so it'll be really cool to compare notes on uh, on where we are in in a couple of years time. Um, question from Mike Pryor Jones asking, uh, could you elaborate a little more on your experience of using full IoT stack model rather than traditional telemetry plus gateway model? Bringing IP down to each node means a lot more computing power at the node and potentially higher power consumption as a result. Can you explain additional benefits of having IP all of the way to the nodes? Well, so I just, I, I guess, go back down to the, the it's, it's all about power, really. Everything has been designed to be as low power as possible. Um, the great thing about having them all having their, IP, their own IP addresses is that you can communicate with them individually and you can add new ones into the system. Um, it, it's basically just, just get, we just managed to get them as, as low power as possible. So you use, and if I just let me go back to this, I don't know how far back it is. Yeah, so you make sure in these, these layers, each one is absolutely as, as low power as possible because you're always struggling always struggling with power so you've got an operating system that's that, that's low power all these everything is basically low power to keep it going but it worked and we were quite you know amazingly impressed that it, it got across that about three kilometers um it's quite impressive yeah i think that's really that's really cool and you know in a way simplicity to have it ip all the way but um only if you can make the power compromises yeah yeah. Uh, a question from Dinjanta Busan Das, uh, purely from an experimental point of view, have you experimented if there was any difference in data collected from the same environment using a different sensor network architecture? Ooh, that's a big ask. Uh, no. <laughs> well, <laughs> only in the sense that, I, I guess in a way, actually, yes, in the sense that, that we were there quite a while and that every year we kind of updated um, because as we developed, because we, Certainly, with, with the Glax web system, we started in 2002 um, and we finished basically in 2012, uh, no, 2013. So that was essentially 10 years. And during that time, you know, things became minute, more miniaturized. We were able to um, have lower power. Uh, and so, in a sense, yes, we were sort of different systems because just because we were in the same place. But it was really, you know, it's really hard. And every time, you have to update the technology. That's a whole change to almost everything, the hardware, the software. So there's there's a lot of iterations of, of all those elements, which is quite um, you know, time consuming.
Um, a question from me, uh, thinking about kind of data, data transmission and, and packeting and, and trying to make your data as small as possible. You talked a lot about this in the GPS. How did you manage to do it with the um, the tilt sensors? Like, I really love the the video that you were able to make of the probe moving in the till. Did you have to do much processing on board in order to get the data small enough, or were you able to transmit all the data from the uh, uh, accelerometers? Yeah, we, we transmitted all the data and we did the analysis um, back home. Um, at those early systems, we wouldn't have had enough power um, or computing power to do the analysis there. Um, we just, you know, we, we sent it all back. Um, it came back, um, I think initially once every three hours, and by the end it came back. Oh, it was recorded every every hour, and then it comes back once a day. So that's why we only send the data back once a day because that's that's the really sort of high energy thing to do. And how were you able to send sufficient data in order to get that positional data? You know that that must have been a huge data transmission daily to get that kind of detail. How how did you how did you design the, the data packaging? Um I think they're all pretty much the same. Um I don't think that was any more difficult than anything else. Um I mean, it's all it's all just about making the packages as as small as possible. You don't send anything that's not um vital. You just send the the essential information. Great, thank you. Um, just an opportunity for um, any final questions, if you could pop them in the Q&A box. Um, and while I give you the opportunity to type those, Jane, can you tell us what's next? What are you going to, uh, what's your next research goal with these uh, these sensor networks? That was going to be my question too. Oh, right, oh, okay. <laughs> in terms um, of field work, I guess, yeah, other experiments planned or something, Jane. <laughs> Well, our next, I guess our next plan is to try and, but well, I guess we've got two different sort of sections. I mean, one, we've got two, two fields. I mean, first is to try, I'm just going to go back to my picture. Um, but going back to the Internet of Things, um, thing, so we'd like to develop a system where you could change you could have a sort of like multi multi sensing system which you could use anywhere which you could change the the, the power the communication systems that you used and that you could change it from um, from your desk so it would be an, an, an internet of things system which had different communication systems depending on what you were sensing in the environment so a sort of multi-sensor thing we, we'd love to make that and that that's sort of on, on the, the one hand and then our, our kind of second element is to to develop our, our RTK thing, but to have it um, loaded by drones. And we think there's a, a big chance of, of, of using drones to deposit sensors, to collect sensors, to use the sensors themselves. And, and as drone technology improves, we can um, relate this to sensor networks. So that's that's what we'd like. So those are our kind of two um, avenues that we'd like to go forwards within sensor networks. Great, we'll be, uh, we'll be watching this space. Um, uh, final question from Thomas Robinson. How do you know when you have enough data and how do you decide how many sensor nodes to have? Oh God, that's like, how long is a piece of string, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I think that, that that's probably a, 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 almost a sort of philosophical question. In the old days, as that's, what, that's why I showed that picture, was that we had, we, had, we had small data, but each individual point was really valuable and, and you know, it took an hour, two hours to collect. Um, you wrote it in your notebook, you didn't lose it, you kept thinking you'd lost your notebook. Um, and now we've moved to this big data where it was, it's not there's too much data, it's just you do have to know what, what's important. And I think Part of the sensor networks is because you have to design everything so low power, you don't collect anything at the moment that's not vital. Um, that might obviously change in the future. I think you have to plan from the very beginning what is the bare minimum that you need to sense a system. Um, 
you know, when you uh, you can't sense everything and you do have to put a sensible amount and that that is quite difficult because if you think about sort of victorian surveyors they didn't have many points in the environment but they were able to produce their maps and as you go through time the maps get better but they're not that different you know they're, they're still the highest mountain is the highest mountain you, you kind of fill in the details and i think with the sensor network again you, you might not be able to pick up everything but having that basic framework is a huge step forward and there are many things in, in environmental science that we know nothing about i mean i can the glacial environment we know virtually nothing about the winter and since we've been able to put in sensor networks and logging systems, suddenly you know what's happening in the winter. And the winter is actually a really exciting time in the glacial environment. But before we had these systems, we didn't know. Um, so I would say when you build a sensor network, you build for the lowest, at the moment, you, you build for the lowest frequency, I mean, sampling frequency, because you want to get the data back. And there's always this element of fear that you're not going to get anything back. I mean, the first time, the first year we did our study, we didn't. None of the probes worked, nothing worked. Um, and then we went back the next year and everything worked because we learned from our mistakes. So I would say you start with the bare minimum and then you build from that um, to get a big, better picture. But we can always have a better picture of the world, but we want to know a base level of what's there at the moment. Fantastic. That's a really good point to end on. Um, thank you, Jane. I really, really enjoyed that talk. Um, I hope everyone else did as well. Um, a reminder that this and all the other webinars will shortly be posted on our um, YouTube channel. So do go ahead and check it out there or check out our webpage, digitalenvironment.org, uh, where you can find details of the past webinars and the next webinar. We're taking a summer break now. Um, but we'll be back on the 10th of September. Speaker is still to be confirmed for that, but in uh, October, we'll have um, Scott Ensign and Shannon Hicks from Enviro DIY telling us about um, how to create your own sensor system and a load of tools that they've um, developed in order to enable people to make their own sensor networks and get the, that data onto the web. And then more polar stuff at the end of October, Sridhar Jarawak from uh, the Svalbard Information Observing System is going to be telling us about um, satellite data applications in Svalbard and sensors that they use there. So please keep an eye out for our um, speaker announcement for 10th of September. Have a lovely summer break and we'll catch up in the autumn. Bye bye. <laughs>